right, today we're going to take a look at section 2.3, which is on deductive reasoning. Um, and when we look at this, we're also going to look at symbolic notation a little bit. So this is going to give us a, a shorter way to write logical statements, rather than having to write the whole thing out every time. Okay, so let's start off by looking at symbolic notation. As I just said, it basically gives us a shorter way to write out a conditional statement. It's like using variables in algebra to represent something. What's different about symbolic notation is our variables don't represent numbers, usually. They represent statements. Okay? Statements or parts of a sentence. So generally, we use the variable p to represent the hypothesis. Okay, whatever the hypothesis is, and we use Q to represent the conclusion. Okay, so Q is a variable that represents the statement. That's my conclusion. And we'll pretty much always stick with using P and Q. In algebra, sometimes you switch the variable depending on the problem, um, but generally we won't be switching up the P and the Q. And one other symbol that we're going to be using is this arrow. And this arrow you pronounce as implies. So if we had something like a P, an arrow, and then a Q, we would say P implies Q. Which basically means if P happens, then Q is going to happen. So it's a shorter way of writing an if-then statement. And here's, here's an example. Okay, this example says, if the sun is out, then the weather is good. Okay. The sun is out. That part is the hypothesis. So P is going to represent everything underlined in red. The conclusion is, the weather is good. Q is going to represent the conclusion. Okay, everything underlined in blue. So in symbolic notation, we would write this. Bless you. P implies Q. Which is equivalent to saying, if P, then Q. Okay? It's just a much faster way of doing it now. Any question on this notation, P implies Q? The only thing you have to do when you use this notation is you have to tell the person reading it what P is and what Q is. Okay, you have to be clear about that. Okay, so if I didn't have this statement up above and all you saw was P implies Q, you wouldn't know what P and Q are. Okay, so we have to make sure people know what they are. Another symbol that we can use to shorten up our writing of um, the inverse statement or the contrapositive is this little curve symbol here. And that symbol means negate or not. So whenever you see that in front of a letter, you pronounce this as the word not. So if I said something like that, that means not P. Or in the example up above, it would be if the sun is not out. That would be the negation of P. Okay. What would be the negation of Q up above? So Q is the weather is good. Not Q would be Katrina. The weather is not good. The weather is not good. Okay. The weather is not good. All right. So that's what that little symbol means. Not. So. What I want to do is take an original statement. Okay, in this case, I'm just representing it generically. P implies Q. We don't know what P and Q are. If you want to pretend it's an example, use the weather problem from up above. Let P be the, the sun is out. Let Q be the weather is good. But all I want to do is use symbolic notation to write those three things. The converse inverse 
and the contrapositive. Okay, so Jacob, how would you write the converse using symbolic notation? How do you find the converse? What's the rules for if you have an if then statement? Switch what two things? Um, yes, switch the hypothesis and the conclusion. So in this case, P is always our hypothesis and Q is our conclusion. So basically, how would it look if you just switch those two around? Yep, and how do you pronounce that arrow? You, you want to help him out? How do you pronounce it? Implies. Q implies P. That's your converse. Okay, in symbolic notation. Okay, how about the inverse? Okay, how about uh, Nick? What, is, what does the inverse mean we do again? Converse is when you switch the hypothesis and conclusion. You want to about what does inverse mean? You don't have to tell me the whole answer yet. Just inverse means to take each part and do what to it? Yeah. Not P equals not Q. Close. Be careful. Not P is not the whole line thing. implies. Not Q. Yeah. Not P implies not Q. So in the case of the weather one, it would be if the weather, or what was it? Uh, if the sun is not out, the weather is not good. I'm not saying that's true or false. I'm just saying that's what the inverse would be. Okay. And the last one, our contrapositive. Anyone remember how you, how you do that one? Marquis? Wait, it's the converse and the inverse kind of put together. So can you tell me what, what that would be? Not Q implies not P. Perfect. Not Q implies not P. There's your contrapositive in symbolic notation. Questions on that? So it's, it's handy to use symbolic notation because it does save us a lot of time rather than having to write things out. Okay, we're still going to write some things out. But when we can use this, we, uh, we will. Okay, any guess about a biconditional? What the symbol would look like? So instead of writing if and only if, we need a P on one side, we need a Q on the other, and we need something between the P and the Q to show that it goes in both directions, not just one. So it's almost common sense, but what you think you might use is, is actually what you do use. Oh, it'd be arrows on both sides. Yeah, it's, it's a double-ended arrow. Yeah. So a biconditional statement means if P then Q, and separately, switching it, the converse, if Q then P, which we often see written as P if and only if Q. But there's even a shorter way than using if and only if. We can say P, double-ended arrow, which you pronounce if and only if, and then Q. So these three, three ways you're seeing here are all equivalent. This is one way to write it. That's a second way. That's a third way. The second way we would call symbolic, way one and three, that's just writing it all out. Any questions on how you write a biconditional symbolically? All right, so example two says, let P be the statement, the value of x is negative 5. Let Q be the statement, 
the absolute value of x is 5. This time I'm giving you something symbolically and I want to see if you can tell me what it would be the long way. Okay, so it says right, and somebody tell me how do we pronounce this? Yeah, how about the whole thing? No, P implies Q. Yes, so right, P implies Q in words. Okay, anyone think they could tell me how to write that out? P implies Q as an if-then statement, a long way. Yeah, Ian? If P then Q. Well, we've got to write it, that's still symbolic. So when they ask in words, we actually have to use the words. So go ahead. So instead of saying if P, just say if. If the value of x equals negative 5. All right, so we'll start with that. If the value of x is negative 5. And then we can't say then Q. We have to say then. Then the absolute value of x equals 5. Yes, the absolute value of x is 5. Okay, that's how you write it out. Ariel, is that true? If, if x is negative 5, then the absolute value would be 5. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is true. They're not asking here if this is true or false. They just wanted it written out, whether it's true or false. Okay. So take a second and try that one on your own, and then I'm going to ask you if that one's true. Write Q implies P in words. Um, what's the name of Q implies P? This is the the what of the original statement? Inverse. No, not the inverse. This is the converse, yes. So I'm asking you to write the converse of the original statement in words. Okay. And then look at it and see if you can figure out if it's true or it's false. How about um, Dakota? What did you get for um, writing that out? Q implies P. So let's start with that. If absolute value of x equals 5. Yep, go ahead. Then the value of x equals negative 5. Then the value of x is negative 5. Okay. That's correct. That is the converse. Q implies p. Uh, but somebody else, is that um, true? What do we think? Think about it, Alyssa. Yeah, that's, that's false. Okay, what we've done here is correct, but this isn't a true statement. If the absolute value of x is 5, then that means x must have been negative 5. No, nope, x could have been positive 5. Okay, so it's, it's not a true statement. Well, I guess I just kind of answered the last part. Now C says, is the biconditional true? So for the biconditional to be true, part A has to be true, and part B has to be true. So is the biconditional true? Kira? No. Kira, what part was true out of the biconditional? Part A or part B? Part A was true. So this statement is true in one direction, but it's not true in the other direction. So the answer to C is no. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? So let's try, um, let's try these two. Okay, P is it is raining. Q is the game is canceled. Again, you always assume P is your hypothesis. Q is always your conclusion. Always use those variables. Okay, so try writing those two statements in words. So write the contrapositive and then write the inverse. Okay, we didn't, we didn't do these two yet. First statement they're looking for is write the contrapositive of P implies Q. Yeah, how about Dakota? Can you start me off with just the first first part of that? The game is not canceled with it's not raining. Okay, yeah, that's the whole thing. So the game the game is not canceled. If the game is not canceled. Then, go ahead, what would you say? Then it is not raining. Yes, then it is not raining. So 
So he switched the hypothesis and conclusion and negated both. Perfect. Okay, the second part. Write the inverse of P implies Q. Denver? Okay, so the inverse. Want to help him out? Yep. Selena? Um, <coughs> yep. Okay, good. So with, with the inverse, you keep the P and the Q in the same order. You just make both parts not. You negate both parts. So if it is not raining, oops. So if it is not raining, then the game is not canceled. Questions on that? All right. So we said both of these statements back on, um, I think it was last Thursday, when we did 2.1. A conditional statement is logically equivalent to its contrapositive. So if you take the original and you take the contrapositive, they are logically equivalent. What does that mean? if two statements are logically equivalent to each other. And it's really like, you could almost look at it as two different cases if you wanted. Denver? They both mean the same thing. So basically, if I give you a statement that's false and have you find it's contrapositive, then the contrapositive is also going to be false. If I give you an original statement that's true and I have you find it's contrapositive, then that will also be true. Conditional statement and it's um, contrapositive are logically equivalent to each other. And the converse and inverse are also logically equivalent. Meaning if the converse of a statement is true, then the inverse of that statement will also be true. If the converse is false, then the inverse is also false. Any question on those two ideas? Okay, I think we, I know we definitely mentioned the first idea in section 2.1. I'm not sure if we mentioned the second idea. Okay. But they are on, um, <coughs> they are both on page 88, if you need to see them. So the last part of this section gets into deductive reasoning. Okay. Deductive reasoning is basically using facts okay, or statements that are given almost in like a chain of events. One leads to the next and you determine what's going to happen. So sometimes we have facts, sometimes we have definitions, sometimes we have properties. Um, sometimes I talk about it being cloudy and getting ice cream. Okay, all kinds of different examples. Um, but the idea is what I'm saying is a logical argument. So there's two laws that we can use to do deductive reasoning. Okay, and the first one is called the law of detachment. And the law of detachment basically says that if P implies Q is a true conditional statement, and P is true, then Q is automatically true. It's going to happen. That's right. Here's an example. Say you had the statement, if I study for at least two hours, then I will do well on the test. I'm telling you that's a true statement. If I study for at least two hours, then I will do well on the test. 
I'm going to tell you that the person studied for at least two hours. What do you know is going to happen now? Because they studied at least two hours. They're going to do well on the test. Exactly. That's the law of detachment. Okay, another example would be if it's cloudy, then I'm going to stay inside today. I'm telling you it's cloudy out. So what does that mean I'm going to do? Stay I'm going to stay inside. Okay. So because P was true, it is cloudy, then Q automatically follows or it's automatically going to happen. And the second law is the law of syllogism. So what I'm doing is I'm going to give you both laws and then we'll go into examples. So I want you to have all the laws together though. Okay, so the law of syllogism is it's like when you have a chain of things happening. So if P implies Q is a true statement, and then Q implies R is also a true statement, then that automatically means if P happens, R is going to happen. Okay, it's like a chain of things. So I gave an example earlier. If, if it is cloudy, then I stay inside. If I stay inside, then I play a game. So then if I tell you it is cloudy out, then I'm automatically going to play a game. Right? And you can have as many of those, you could have three or four of these chains in a row. If P implies Q, and then Q implies R, and R implies X, and X implies Y, then basically P, if P happens, Y happens. Okay? Kind of think of them as dominoes. Once you knock over P, everything else is going to happen and follow all the way through to R. Uh, like you said, the segment addition postulate? I kind of remind you of that. A little bit, yeah. Yep. Some people also think of it as the transitive property from algebra. If A equals B um, and B equals C, then A equals C. That's, that's the transitive property from uh, Algebra 1. And we use, we use this idea in many different places. You could do it with parallel lines. If line A is parallel to line B, and line B is parallel to line C, then line A and line C are also parallel. It's, it's kind of like that. So yep, yep that's good. Okay, so there's our, our two laws. Okay, so example four um, gives us this statement. And I want us to know if the conclusion here is valid. And if it is, I want to know are they using the law of detachment for the law of syllogism. Okay, so let's just read it over. It says, Jamal knows that if he misses practice the day before a game, he will not be a starting player for the game. Jamal misses practice on Tuesday and concludes he will not be able to start in Wednesday's game. So I want to know if his reasoning makes sense. Yeah? Yes. Yes. His, his reasoning is correct. What law did he use? Is that the law of detachment or the law of syllogism? Well, if it's the law of syllogism, then that means we had a chain of things happening. So like if he missed practice, then he's not a starting player. If he's not a starting player, uh, he won't have a chance to score a touchdown. So if he misses practice, then he doesn't have a chance to score a touchdown. That would be an example of law of syllogism. Okay. This is law of detachment. Okay. So basically it says, if he misses practice the day before a game, then he can't be a starting player. So now this is the key part we're looking at. Jamal misses practice the day before a game, Tuesday. And then he automatically says, well, if I miss practice on Tuesday, what does that mean? I can't play in the game the next day. So that's the law of detachment. Okay. Any questions why that's law of detachment? So it says, is the argument valid? Here's our answer.
Yes, it is valid. Specifically, it's the law of detachment. Okay, here's another one. If two angles form a linear pair, then they are supplementary. If two angles form a linear pair, then they are supplementary. Angle A and angle B are supplementary. So they form a linear pair. Is this reasoning valid? Okay. It has to be the law of detachment or the law of syllogism if it's valid. Kira? Yes, it's true. Okay, let's look at it as in symbolic notation. Let P be what I underlined in red. Two angles form a linear pair. Let Q be, they are supplementary. So we're saying P implies Q. That's true. If two angles form a linear pair, then they are supplementary. Angle A and angle B are supplementary. So we're saying Q is true. Okay, that's the fact they give us. Angle A and angle B are supplementary. So now the question is, they're automatically saying, oh, because Q is true, that means P is true. So does this mean P is true? So the law, does the law of detachment work in that order? The law of detachment says that if, if P applies Q is a true statement, okay, we have that, and the first part is true, P is true. If you've got that, then you know Q is automatically true. But they're switching the order. They're saying we have that. Does the law of detachment go in the other direction? No. This is not a valid argument. This is wrong. You can't say what this person tried to say here. Okay, think of the example that we did um, with the football. Okay, when we, f we said something about if, um, what was that example? If if you score a touchdown, then the ball crosses the goal line. So if you score a touchdown, then ball crosses goal line. Okay. And this is like saying the ball crossed the goal line. I'm going to tell you that the second half is true. So ball crosses the goal line. Does that automatically mean that the first part's true? You scored a touchdown. No. Okay? It doesn't, the law of detachment doesn't work in that order. You have to know the first part's true. And that implies the second. Okay? Any question on that? A lot of people get confused with that on the test. They'll say that something like this is valid, and it's not. So a lot of detachment, you have to have the hypothesis being true, not the conclusion. You need the first part. OK, so looking at this one, example five, I want to write a conditional statement that can be made from the three that I have here. I think the book actually gives you like five or six. Okay, I only put up three because I don't, I don't think we need to spend that long on this. Okay, so we're going to use the law of syllogism. Okay, first statement says, if a bird is the fastest bird on land, then it is the largest of all birds. Statement two says, if a bird is the largest of all birds, then it is an ostrich. Statement three says, if a bird is the largest of all birds, then it is flightless. So 
So I want to combine a couple of these statements together using the law of syllogism. Go ahead. Yep, Denver. Okay, so you use statement one and which one? Three. So statement one, if a bird is the fastest bird on land, then it is the largest. Statement three says if it's the largest, then it is flightless. So what was your final statement? Yes. So that's that's a perfect answer. If if a bird is the fastest bird on land, fastest bird on land, then it is flightless. Any question on how he, he got that conclusion, combining one and three? Is there any other statements we could make besides combining one and three? What do you think? Any, any other way we can combine? I think there's another, there's another fact that you could get out of this. Well, Alyssa? Oh, let's think of all the different ways you can combine them. You could try to combine one and three. Okay, we did that. What else could you try besides one and three? Okay, you could try two and three, or you could try one and two. Okay, let's, let's try two and three and see if that makes sense. So two is, if a bird is the largest, then it's an ostrich. If a bird is the largest, then it's flightless. <coughs> Can we combine two and three in any way? What do you think? Ian? If a bird is the largest of all birds, then it is flightless. If the bird is the largest of all birds, then? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure we can combine two and three. To combine a statement, you need the ending of one statement, then it is the largest, <coughs> to be the beginning of another one if it is the largest. Okay? That's how you can combine them. So do we have a sentence that starts out with flightless? Um, I don't think we do. No. So that, that actually, that might be the only way we can combine these statements. Actually, hope, actually, no, I think we can do one and two, right? If a bird is the fastest, then it's the largest. If it's the largest, then it's an ostrich. So we can also combine statements one and two and say, if a bird is the fastest bird on land, then it is an ostrich. That's, that's also correct. Or you can do the one Denver said. Both of those are correct. Okay, and one more with the law of syllogism. It says, over the summer, Mike visited Alabama. Given the true statements, can you conclude that he visited the Civil Rights Memorial? It says, if Mike visits Alabama, which we know he did. It says it up at the top. If Mike visits Alabama, then he will spend a day in Montgomery. If he spends a day in Montgomery, then he will visit the Civil Rights Memorial. So can we conclude, because he went to Alabama, He's going to go to the Civil Rights Memorial. Katrina? Yes. We know he's going to visit Alabama, so the rest of these statements automatically follow. He's going to spend a day in Montgomery, and because he goes to Montgomery, we know he's going to spend a visit at the Civil Rights Memorial. So the answer is yes. Okay. And what law is that that let us just um, assume that's true, that that's a valid logical argument? Law of syllogism, yes. Law of syllogism. Perfect. Okay, so those are the two, the two laws that you can use when you're reasoning in logic.
right, so that'll be the um, homework for tonight. On page 91, um, 1, 3, 9 to 19 odd, 23 to 25 all. And then 31 to 35 all, 37, 39, 45, and 47. Okay, on the MCAS, let's do uh, four through six. Okay, so take a look at four through six.